Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Traveling Librarian. I'm Jeff Klapes from the Reference Department at BB Library in Wakefield, and I'm happy to have you join me on yet another armchair travel adventure. If you enjoy travel, please do follow me on Instagram or check out our YouTube channel with other episodes, and always please feel free to email me with any questions. This time um, today, instead of an exotic foreign destination, we're going to be staying a little bit closer to home, taking a look at the lovely city of Charleston, South Carolina. Charleston is the largest city in South Carolina, although the capital of the state is actually Columbia. Charleston has, uh, Charleston proper has about 130,000 people, but the metro area around it is much closer to the size of Boston. Um, it's not very far. Um, here you can see Charleston up in this corner, um, just down the coast, um, pretty, uh, pretty close by car. It is not very far from Hilton Head, um, another popular travel destination, and just over the border in Georgia is the city of Savannah. It's at the confluence of several low country rivers, mainly the Ashley River on the west here and the Cooper River on the east, um, which meet in uh, the very broad and open Charleston Harbor, which is very wide and protected by barrier islands and wetlands, which of course um, would historically make it a very good place uh, to build a city. This aerial view shows you the contrast between the very developed city um, downtown and stretching a little bit inland um, compared to the wetlands around it, which are much less developed. There's also uh, quite a bit of a demographic division with a racial divide. Uh, like the rest of the state of South Carolina, about a third of the city is minority, but the wealthy historic center where most of the tourist um, interest is, is uh, noticeably whiter than the rest of the city. Um, you can see Fort Sumter here at the harbor entrance, but the historic city center where we're going to spend most of our time in this presentation um, is at the tip of the peninsula here. Uh, King Charles II granted the area in 1663 and settlers followed soon after, although for the most part, they actually originally settled further up the river a few miles, up the Ashley River. Uh, the climate is very moderate, as you can imagine, with short winters compared to us up here in New England, um, but they do have lots of rain and humidity in the summer, and its history is full of things like malaria, yellow fever, uh, hurricanes, coastal pirates, and even a couple of major earthquakes, believe it or not. This is the tourist bureau in the center of town. Um, they declared independence in 1774, the state of South Carolina, which um, for a long time was of course very heavily dependent on the slave trade, as well as growing tobacco and cotton, um, and even more so rice, which was a crop that grew there much better um, than tobacco or cotton. It's the first city in the country to create a formal historic district. That was back in 1931. Um, and today, the downtown area covers um, a, a, pretty much the entire um, southern tip of the peninsula with an absolutely unsurpassed collection of residential and commercial buildings from over 300 years of history, including most of the major architectural styles of the 18th and 19th centuries. It's an absolutely stunning assemblage of buildings uh, to stroll around, and many of them can be visited. Through this presentation, you'll see a number of the, the beautiful different styles of buildings, um, very elegant homes, including uh, enormous mansions like these, and also some very beautiful parks and gardens. Um, and even the commercial district is quite historic as well. At the very southern tip of the peninsula is Battery Park. Um, here you can see a monument to the Confederate defenders of Charleston um, at Fort Sumter, which we're going to visit in a little bit. Around the Battery Park area, there are some fantastic restored homes. Most of the homes in this area are in fact single family homes. They have not been converted into condos or apartments. Um, most of them do have uh, water views, although <clears throat> it's certainly risky um, in this day and age to have valuable property so close to the water, particularly in hurricane season, 
Um, Charleston is, of course, very low to the ground. There's very little elevation. Um, most of the city is only a few feet above sea level. And uh, they have been hit by a number of hurricanes over the years. The worst probably was in 1989 when Hurricane Hugo slammed into the city and did over $3 billion in damage. It's nice to stroll along the harbor front um, and on the east coast on the uh, Cooper River is a lovely waterfront park um, where you'll see the pineapple fountain, which is sort of a symbol of the city, a landmark. Um, the pineapple is a well-known uh, symbol of hospitality. So this is a, a nice uh, photo opportunity for tourists, but it's a, a very nice place to stroll along the harbor front. Another focal point of the commercial area is the downtown market. Uh, it's the center of the city um, and was built in the early 19th century. This is a Greek revival, uh, sort of an administrative hall for the market that was built in 1841. Uh, you can see the market halls stretching out behind it. Um, and this building has now been turned, um, starting in about the 1890s, it was converted uh, into a building for a museum of the Confederacy by the Daughters of the Confederacy of Charleston. And stretching out behind that building, um, the market bustles all day long and in the evening as well. It's, it's very similar to Quincy Market here in Boston. Nearby on Meeting Street, which is the main drag through the city, um, is the circular congregational church built in 1890, uh, kind of similar to uh, in style to Trinity Church in Boston, kind of Romanesque revival. Um, although this is a much smaller church, but it's quite beautiful and the sanctuary inside is completely round. The commercial district centers on Meeting Street um, and it heads south and crosses Broad Street. Uh, two of the main roads. And then there are a couple of other districts a little uh, further to either side on East Bay Street and King Street. Um, you'll see a lot of beautiful commercial buildings like this, um, mostly from the 19th century. There are hotels um, and restaurants and cafes and shops all through this area. It's a pretty expensive city, uh, to be honest, for tourism. Um, there are very, very nice hotels, but um, it's hard to find any that are terribly cheap. Um, food is a little bit more mixed. You can get great street food, market food, um, as well as extremely high-end restaurants. As you head down Meeting Street, you come to uh, the corner of Meeting and Broad, which is one of the main intersections in the city. And at that intersection, you'll see this enormous church, uh, St. Michael's Church, which was built in the 1750s. And it's the oldest surviving church building in the city. The steeple is 186 feet high. And this intersection is actually very important. It's, you can't see it from this photo, um, but it's known as the four corners of law because on each corner of this intersection um, is an important public building uh, representing some aspect of the law. On one corner is City Hall. Um, on another is the County Courthouse. On a third is the Post Office and Federal Courthouse. And then on the fourth corner is this church representing ecclesiastical law. The residential neighborhoods, particularly the further south you go towards uh, Battery Park, is, uh, are just spectacular, huge mansions with porches along the sides, many of which have uh, a very distinctly Southern feel. They have lots of balconies, um, overhanging eaves to keep the houses cool, and lots of greenery. The local style in Charleston um, makes frequent use of what they call piazzas, a porch. Um, these are used to provide shade um, and also uh, a place to sleep outside um, and get cool breezes, particularly during the heat of the summer. Another interesting style that you see is this very typical narrow Charleston style, very long and skinny, 
Um, and the front door, if you're looking at the house um, from the street, the front door, which you would expect to open into a stairway or a parlor or something like that, actually opens onto a piazza down the side of the house, as you can see here, rather than directly into the home. And that's a very typical style for houses all over Charleston. Um, many of the styles are from the 19th century, so you'll see things like Greek Revival homes, Italianate homes, Second Empire homes, um, but all of them have been slightly um, adapted to the southern climate. So uh, regardless of the style, they tend to have very high ceilings um, and lots and lots of porches and overhanging greenery to keep, uh, keep the homes cool. Here are some of the ones along the waterfront. Most of the homes also have very nice lush gardens with live oaks, um, palm trees, um, and other subtropical vegetation. The city does have a grid pattern. Um, it's mostly flat, as I mentioned, um, and the residential neighborhoods are just a delight to stroll around. Um, it's, uh, it's a very well organized and easily oriented city. It's hard to get lost um, and it's very walkable. Um, so uh, it's actually almost a disadvantage to have a car. It's much better to just uh, find a nice place to stay in the center and stroll around the different neighborhoods. Um, as I said, the commercial streets are also quite nice. And here's a couple of examples where um, very beautiful uh, 19th century buildings have been restored and now they house shops and restaurants, cafes, some have been converted into hotels, um, and there's a number of excellent museums as well. Here's an example of um, a street on East Bay Street, which is the, the street that follows the eastern side of the peninsula along the Cooper River near the waterfront. This is a a uh, group of buildings called Rainbow Row for obvious reasons. It's a series of Georgian row houses that have been painted in bright pastel colors. Um, interspersed among all of the houses, you'll um, come upon these enormous mansions in all different styles. Um, if you check the real estate listings, you'll find that houses of this type and size tend to be um, somewhere in the five to ten million dollar range. This is a very, very high end neighborhood. As you look up the river from uh, the waterfront where these mansions are, you will see the Arthur Ravenel Bridge, which is a cable stayed bridge over the Cooper River that connects downtown Charleston to the um, city of Mount Pleasant. Um, a little further east. It's the third longest cable state bridge um, in the Western Hemisphere. It's about 1,500, 1,550 feet long, roughly. Um, it's a pretty recent bridge. It was opened only in 2005. I loved uh, strolling around the city. It's a, it's a great place for street life and um, just ambling around. Um, you can't beat a city where um, a store not only has free public restrooms, but also gives you free samples of praline. Um, and something that you would probably not likely see up here in New England is a van that's selling frozen alcohol um, that you can have to stroll around the city with um, in the heat. At night, it's also a very nice city to walk around. It's a very safe city um, for the most part, uh, certainly in the tourist areas. Um, at night, um, the crime rate is uh, not a problem. And as long as you take simple precautions, you'll find that it's a very pleasant area to stroll around with lots to see and do. And many of the monuments um, and downtown buildings are lit up. Here's an example of a good heavy Southern breakfast that will get you started in the morning. Um, it's not uncommon to find homemade biscuits, grits with or without cheese, um, hush puppies, gravy, um, very solid um, filling American food for breakfast. 
um, we wandered around on a um, pleasant Sunday morning, and that was a nice time to visit a number of the churches. Um, there are lots and lots of churches, um, historic churches in downtown Charleston. On the left, here you see two that are right next to each other. On the left is the Unitarian Church, and on the right is the Lutheran Church, both of which have very nice graveyards uh, behind them. The Unitarian Church is, in fact, the oldest Unitarian Church anywhere in the American South. The, uh, the cemetery behind it is very atmospheric. Um, there's nobody famous buried here, but um, it makes a wonderful spot uh, to walk around um, and enjoy the gardens and the kind of overgrown atmosphere with lots of Spanish moss hanging from the trees. We were there in the spring. Uh, in fact, this was a trip we took right before, just about a week before um, COVID shut everything down. Uh, so this was in April of, uh, I'm sorry, March of 2020, um, when in Charleston, uh, spring is uh, really in, in full bloom. You see lots and lots of uh, spring flowers, azaleas, rhododendrons, and so forth. About a block away from those churches, um, is an interesting old monument. This is the old jail for the city, which was built in 1802 and was used uh, quite a long time. Um, in fact, well into the 20th century until about uh, World War II. It's in serious need of renovation, but it's now used for ghost tours. So um, you, you can't wander the building on your own, but you can sign up for a haunted Charleston tour where they will take you through the building at night for um, a creepy adventure. Um, and right next to the jail is a very different kind of building. This is the old Marine Hospital, um, which is a kind of interesting Gothic revival building with, again, with these fantastic porches on the front. Um, it's now used by the City Housing Authority. Another of the major historic churches, probably uh, one of the most important, is St. Philip's Church um, on Church Street, um, which was built in 1838. There were three very important churches on Church Street, hence the name. Um, this version was built after a fire um, in the early 19th century. And you can see the gorgeous uh, classical interior. Um, another church on that same street is the 1845 Gothic church, all in this uh, lovely light pink coral color. Uh, and it's a French Huguenot church. It's in fact, the only French Huguenot uh, congregation anywhere in the United States. On the left is just an example of another typical, um, more modest Charleston style of home. Here's a view of that church from the side. Um, it's surrounded by gardens, and when the sun is on it, it really it glows this wonderful uh, peach peach coral kind of pinky color. There's also buildings like this one that almost make you think of New Orleans with the um, the iron balconies, and a lot of um, very typical. Um, Greek revival, classical revival, revival buildings that were built in the first half of the 19th century. Down in this same neighborhood um, is a museum that really you should not miss if you go uh, to Charleston. This is the old Slave Mart Museum. It's thought to be the only remaining building anywhere in the city that was actually used for slave trading. Uh, slave trading was usually done indoors uh, for the sake of propriety rather than doing it uh, out where everyone could see it. Um, this building has been converted into a superb museum of the history of uh, slave trading in the South. It's obviously a very important part of the, the state's history and something that is difficult, obviously, for people to kind of come to terms with. And this museum does a very good job of putting it in the context of, of the history of the state. Um, it's worth noting um, that we, we noticed this when we traveled around to a number of the um, historic sites uh, around Charleston, that there is a very conscious effort 
um, for people to refer to slaves um, instead as enslaved people. And the reason for that is that um, they are trying to emphasize the fact that um, these people were not slaves by definition. Um, they were people like you, like me, um, like anyone who were enslaved by others and calling them enslaved people tends to remind you of that um, a little bit more. So you'll find that many of the museums and the plantation homes and so forth have made a conscious effort to change that vocabulary in order for us to um, understand the idea a little bit more. Slavery, of course, um, was for a very long time the economic driver behind the growth that happened in the South and in Charleston. Uh, here are some more examples of fabulous mansions down near the Battery area. The palmetto, you can see a um, palm tree in the center of this photo. The palmetto is the state tree um, and it's the symbol of South Carolina. Um, you'll find that it goes by a number of different names, the palmetto, the cabbage palm, and so forth, but um, obviously they grow everywhere um, along the low country coastal areas. And you'll see them in almost everyone's gardens, along with live oaks that tend to be covered with um, Spanish moss. Oops, I'm sorry, you've seen that photograph already. In the same area as the slave mart um, is Charleston's, uh, what they call the French Quarter, um, where there used to actually be a number of French merchants concentrated in one neighborhood. Now it's just a historic district with cobblestone streets. Um, the pink building you see on the side is called the Pink House Tavern, which was built in 1712 and is one of the oldest buildings in South Carolina. I love uh, fancy artistic manhole covers, and this is one of the ones that they use in the historic district. Um, another museum that's worth visiting is the old exchange building on the east side of the city near the waterfront. This was built in 1771 as a customs house. Um, it was also used by the British uh, during the Revolutionary War to house prisoners, uh, but it has been turned into a very nice museum you can see the um, the prison areas down in the basement, but also upstairs the public rooms. And it has um, some excellent exhibits on the history of the city. Looking out from that building, you can see all the way down Broad Street, which is the the main street that crosses the peninsula from east to west. Um, it's a major divider and um, directions are also given are often given um, based on whether something is north or south of Broad Street. A little further up uh, the waterfront is the current customs building, much more recent, and you can see there's a cruise ship docked um, in the background. There are a number of cruise lines that use the city as a port. Um, for the most part, they tend to uh, be short cruises that leave Charleston and go to the Bahamas, sometimes Bermuda, um, and then come back again. Um, I do want to show you a couple of the major historic properties that you can visit. Um, this one uh, is the Nathaniel Russell House, and it's one of the finest federal style houses anywhere in the United States. It was built in 1808 by a very wealthy merchant and also a slave trader, as you can imagine. Um, but the architecture of this uh, building is absolutely fantastic, um, particularly um, the element that it's best known for, which is this freestanding oval flying staircase that goes up all three floors without actually uh, being connected to the walls. It's a stunning piece of engineering. And you can visit most of the rooms um, on the first and second floors of the house, including the dining room, uh, which has been designed in the Adams style, 
Um, if you're familiar with the historic parts of BB Library, um, the rooms towards the front of our building are uh, also designed in Adam style. And that tends to have very classical decoration with a lot of ornate plaster design on the ceilings and on the walls. And that's um, what much of this building was done in, including um, also on, on the second floor, this apricot colored oval drawing room, which looks out over the gardens, probably the fanciest room in the house. Also on the second floor is this pale gray, very elegant, austere drawing room that looks out onto the main street. Most of the furniture in the house isn't actually original um, to the family, but it's appropriate for the time period of the house. You can see the incredible um, lavish detail in the woodwork and the cornices around the ceilings. The house also has very beautiful gardens um, and there are also kitchens and servants quarters and slave quarters in the back that you can visit as well. Um, not terribly far away, a few blocks away is a much later property, one of the largest ones in the city that you can visit. Um, <clears throat> this is a different style because it was built in 1875, so it's Italianate. Uh, and it's one of the biggest mansions in Charleston. It has more than 35 rooms and it cost $200,000 to build at the time that it was built, which is an astonishing amount of money when you think of the 19th century. Um, it was built by a very wealthy merchant banker, um, a merchant, he was kind of in the, the grocery business um, named George Williams. You can see the incredible um, balconies that look out over the, the gardens on the side of the house. Here's the front entrance. Um, and when William died, it went to his daughter. Um, she happened to be married to the grandson of John C. Calhoun, uh, who was the vice president under John Quincy Adams and also under Andrew Jackson. So it is now known as the Calhoun Mansion, even though uh, Calhoun himself did not build the house or ever lived there. It's just distantly connected to the family. Um, but it's a very elegant neighborhood um, and it's been fabulously restored. The house was purchased by an attorney in the 1970s for only about $220,000 and um, it was privately owned for quite some time and then sold again in 2004 to yet another lawyer. So this is not um, this is not owned by the National Trust or anything like that. It is still privately owned. And most of the house is available for, um, for public visits on a guided tour. The gardens along the side are, are really quite beautiful. These are the ones along the south side of the house underneath the balconies. And you can see just um, fantastic um, shrubbery, topiary, sculpture gardens all of which are overlooked by these two big piazzas. Inside the house is completely over the top Victorian. Um, this is the dining room. And the long central hall that goes from one end of the house to the other that's uh, 50 feet long. And you can see the stairway on the right that goes up to the upper floors. On the second floor um, is one of the largest rooms, the music room full of Victorian clutter with original chandeliers. The current owner is quite a collector of uh, decorative arts. So that's where most of this um, extremely over, overly Victorian decoration comes from. Um, but the original home was full of very, very detailed um, design elements like um, the detail you can see on these hinges and door frames. Um, it's a really excellent example of Victorian architecture. And you can explore the gardens as much as you want. The current owner actually lives um, way up on the top floor, has a suite of rooms there. Um, and this is the street in front of the house with um, big old 
live oak trees that are so old that they're pushing up the sidewalks, much as you might see in parts of Boston. Um, anytime you visit Charleston, I think it's well worth it to take some sort of boat trip to make sure that you can get out into the harbor or up the rivers. Um, if you look across the Cooper River towards Mount Pleasant, you can see the Patriots Point Maritime Museum. That um, large ship is the Yorktown, um, an aircraft carrier that you can visit. Um, they, here's a close-up um, from that side of the river. There's a number of other vessels in addition to the Yorktown. It's a, a great place to take kids or anyone who um, enjoys uh, military ships and planes and so forth. There's lots to explore. And it gives you a great view of the Ravenel Bridge going back towards the downtown area. Probably the single best boat trip that you can take um, is to go out to Fort Sumter, which is what we'll do now. Um, as you take a ferry out around the harbor, you can see nice views of the historic skyline, which has very few tall buildings. So um, for the most part, all you're gonna see is um, the occasional uh, early 20th century uh, commercial buildings sticking up and mostly just a lot of church spires. Here's the ferry that takes you out to Fort Sumter and you can see all the way back up the river to the bridge. <clears throat> Fort Sumter is a, um, was built on a man-made island at the entrance to the harbor. And this is historically important, of course, because it's where the Civil War started. Um, it's named for a Revolutionary War general um, and originally was built after the War of 1812. And then on April 12th, 1861, the South Carolina militia um, artillery, which was on the nearby shore a little bit to the south, um, fired on the Union troops who were garrisoned at the fort. Um, the previous December, um, South Carolina had seceded from the Union. And so this initial attack is considered to be the first shots that would fire, were fired in the war that would ultimately take over a million American lives. So if you take the boat out there, you'll have maybe an hour, hour and a half to explore the fort um, and the exhibits that they have. It's now a US official US national monument. Um, there's also an even better museum um, back on the mainland um, where you get the ferry boat. There's a museum of the fort and the Civil War in general, focusing on uh, South Carolina's involvement in the war. The fort was used um, beyond the Civil War as well. Here in this picture, you can see way off in the distance, you can see the point of land where the Southern artillery actually fired from. Um, three years later, uh, Union forces tried to retake the fort, although they were not successful. And the fort was never really actually completed as it was originally designed. And although uh, people were stationed there after the Civil War, it was never really used militarily. So there were a number of decades of decline and uh, into the 20th century. And finally, in the 1960s, it was turned into a historic monument. From the boat, you get an uh, excellent view of all the, the rows of harborside mansions, as well as the commercial area where you see the spires of the churches downtown, and the customs house and, and other buildings along the waterfront. Charleston also has an excellent aquarium. Um, and here you can see the aquarium and also the um, museum where the um, where the Fort Sumter boats leave from. Here's another beautiful example of a Charleston doorway. One example of the local artistry that you'll find in Charleston are these um, incredibly detailed sweet grass baskets. They've been made for over 300 years by the Gullah people, um, an African-American population that has lived um, for a long time on the coastal islands and lowlands along South Carolina and Georgia. These baskets are made of local marsh grasses um, and even pine needles. I treated myself to one. 
Um, they're incredibly intricate and you can see that um, they have very different colors, and those come from the different kinds of plants that are used. Um, they take anywhere from a few hours for the smallest ones to um, several months to make the most elaborate designs. And you can find a number of places around the city where you can buy them. We also treated ourselves to one of the finer restaurants um, in Charleston, and the city has no shortage of really, really good food. Um, this is called Husk, which is considered one of the best restaurants in town. They specialize in southern inspired food, but using only locally sourced ingredients. Um, and you can see it's in a wonderful old home. It's a very intimate atmosphere inside, just on a little side street. And they have really incredible food. I do want to also take you on a couple of day trips. Um, there are a number of things to see around the city of Charleston um, within 30 to 60 minutes from the city. Um, a couple of them in particular are some beautiful gardens and historic properties. This one is called Drayton Hall. And it's actually the only plantation anywhere in the area that survived the Civil War mostly intact. It's a Georgian style house was built around 17, uh, 1750. And it's an excellent example of that style of architecture, particularly since it's all by itself out on this very flat landscape, um, surrounded by open lawns and live oaks that are dripping with Spanish moss. It was originally a rice plantation um, and stayed in the Drayton family for seven generations before it was eventually passed to the National Trust in the 1970s to be turned into a museum. Here I am demonstrating um, what Spanish moss looks like close up. Uh, Spanish moss is neither Spanish nor actually a moss. Um, it's an epiphyte, a kind of plant that um, grows on other plants and gets its water and nutrition solely from the air and the moisture that um, condenses out of the air and from rainfall as well. Drayton is unusual um, in that it is not a restored home, it's a preserved home. And the difference is um, that instead of being uh, renovated and refurnished to look like it would have been during the height of its use during a particular time period, it has instead um, been stabilized at the point when it, in the 1970s, when it was turned into a museum. So they have preserved it in that state um, to study the architecture and the engineering and the decoration of the house. The guides that take you through the property are extremely knowledgeable about preservation. And they will go into a lot of detail about um, the history of the property and also the rest, the, the preservation work that's been done on it. So there are no furnishings anywhere in the house and the interiors are pretty much in the same condition as when it was acquired in the 1970s. It's very elegantly sited in kind of in isolation on these broad lawns that have alleys of trees and reflecting ponds that go all the way down to the Ashley River. Um, where there is a river walk where you can see the area where the rice paddies were originally located. Drayton also, in addition to rice, also grew indigo, which was a major crop um, in South Carolina as well. And the property originally had probably about 78 enslaved people working there. Here's um, a model showing you the original home, which um, beyond the the central part that still exists today, there were originally two wings with arcades connecting to the main house called flankers. They stood there um, until as late as the 1890s, but they no longer exist. All you can see now are the foundations. You're welcome to wander all the way around the property. There are um, very nice pathways through the woods and along the river where you get a really nice feel for the the, the southern low country landscape.
there's a wonderful view over the reflecting pool, which was added in the Victorian era. And all these incredible trees around the lawns. The inside of the house, as I mentioned, is, is not necessarily what you would expect because it hasn't been um, cleaned up and made beautiful and uh, repainted and so forth. It looks exactly as it did when they acquired the property in 1974. So it's almost a sort of bare haunting feel to it, uh, but you can much better see the details of the construction and the decoration from different time periods in the house's history. There's um, very uh, elegant plaster ceilings and also very, very uh, beautiful and detailed woodwork carving um, all around the windows and on the cornices of the ceiling as well. And over the fireplaces, this is just um, superb carving. A highlight is the stair hall. Each of the floors has four main rooms, um, on one on each corner, and then in the middle is uh, a central hall and the stair hall. So it's a very symmetrical Georgian style. But every single room has this just beautiful, beautiful detailing. And from the inside of the house, you can look out in all four directions to the landscape around. Um, here's just a close up of a corner in one of the upstairs bedrooms where you can see that um, this may have been a very wealthy and elegant home, but it was still actually uh, belonged to a family. So here you can see generations of great and children, um, their heights are marked along the woodwork in one of the doorways upstairs. Also on the property is a small African-American burying ground um, hidden off in the woods, which is a pleasant surprise to find as you're strolling around. And the river walk allows you to see some interesting local wildlife and the beautiful lush landscape of trees and shrubs. Not too far, um, also on the Ashley River, just a few miles away, is a fabulous place called Middleton Place, which is more famous for its gardens than for its house. This is also an 18th century rice plantation, similar to Drayton, um, on the Ashley River. This is um, a view, an aerial view showing um, the formal gardens that step all the way down to the river. It was home to several generations of the Middleton family from the 1740s all the way up to the Civil War. It's actually been owned by the same family for over 300 years. It originally, uh, the property originally had 63,000 acres and over 3,500 enslaved people worked on the plantation at its height, um, harvesting rice and running the property. This is all that's left of what was originally a much larger home that was built in 1755 and was burned by Union soldiers during the Civil War. This is just one wing of the original house to give you an idea of how large it originally was. Um, it's now a museum and um, you can see it has an un kind of unusual, almost a Dutch style with the curved gable. Um, and there are some beautiful furnishings inside that are originals. Um, this is kind of unusual to have so many original furnishings from the family um, decorating the home today. But much more interesting than the house is to stroll around the gardens, which are divided into different uh, styles and types of gardens. Um, the main feature are these terraces that step down gradually towards the river between these two lakes um, that they call butterfly lakes because they 
um, act almost as, as two wings unfolding on either side of these terraces. Um, the gardens are huge. You could easily spend half a day or more wandering around. And you'll occasionally encounter local wildlife. Here's an alligator. This is the South after all, so it's not unusual to find them in rivers. And it's great for bird watching. This is the long reflecting pool. And you will always come around the corner and see surprises like this. Um, there are also some very nice formal gardens, um, flower gardens. In fact, there's a whole area of the property devoted exclusively, exclusively to camellias, different varieties of camellia. And um, here's one example. We were, we were there kind of at the tail end of the, um, the period of camellia blooms, but it was still very, very beautiful. And you can see some of the mangrove swamps um, along the river as well. As I mentioned, it is not at all unusual to run into alligators. Um, here's a pretty good sized one. And behind it, you can see a, a baby alligator. Um, they look slow and like ponderous dinosaurs, but they are definitely not an animal you want to get close to. <laughs> This was a telephoto lens. And in addition to the gardens, you can also wander through the working part of the property where um, this was a working farm, of course. So the plantation stable yards have exhibits focusing on the working life of the plantation with crafts and blacksmithing, livestock uh, management, um, growing heirloom plants and uh, things like that. There's also a, um, just like at Drayton, there is a small burial ground on the property itself. Both of these plantations are barely 30 to 40 minutes outside of downtown um, Charleston. You can take a, day, a, a guided tour um, on a bus that will take you out there, or you could just rent a car. Um, and easily go out and, and go at your own pace. Back in the city, um, there's another mansion that's worth visiting, kind of on the north edge of the downtown uh, historic area. This is another one that has been preserved like Drayton rather than restored. It's called the Aiken Rep House, and it was built in 1820. It's a little different in that this is a, an urban plantation. Um, it was owned by the governor of South Carolina, um, although he's not the one who built the home, but it's associated with him because he's probably the most famous person who lived in it. And it's of all the homes in Charleston, it is probably um, the best example of urban life in Charleston before the Civil War. Um, this door here is actually the main entrance. It's kind of unassuming, um, although when you get up close to it, you can see how much um, detail there is. This is obviously this was a very wealthy um, family. The house has lots of intricate detail in it. Here's the Greek Revival entrance hall. And a highlight of the, the museum is seeing the preserved slave quarters, kitchens, laundry, and service areas that are out back. So this is the mansion um, that faces the street, but this enormous area behind with the laundry yards and um, carriage houses and so forth is very nicely designed as a museum where you can learn more about what it was like to be um, enslaved and serve a family like this in the early 19th century. So the wall that you see in the back is the, the far end of the property. Since this was in the city, it did not have hundreds or thousands of acres around it. This was an urban property. And here you can see um, the slave quarters on the left and the interior of the house on the right where the main family lived. Um, there were actually at this time, because this was not a farm, 
um, there were only seven enslaved people in the house itself um, right here in Charleston. However, um, the Aiken family owned almost 900 other people who worked on his properties um, in the surrounding area outside of the city. And like Drayton, um, because this house has not been restored, it does have a very haunted feeling to it with um, flaking paint and peeling wallpaper. Um, you can imagine a, um, a horror film being, being uh, produced here, um, but it is quite, quite a place. The porches are enormous, um, probably 50 to 75 feet long with very high ceilings um, that would allow the family to have <clears throat> cool places to stay during the hot weather. There's a few pieces of furnishings um, in the house, but for the most part, um, it is in the same condition it was when it was turned into a museum. I found the music room to be probably one of the most ghostly in the entire place. They do have one small area um, that has been restored with period artwork um, from the family's collections and furnishings as well. But most of the house, um, including the slave quarters, is really still just um, completely unrestored and in the preserved condition that it was after it left the family. Just a couple blocks away in that same neighborhood is the oldest museum in the country, um, the Charlestown Museum, which unfortunately is in a kind of drab modern brick building, um, but it does have excellent collections about local history and state history. <clears throat> Just outside on the sidewalk is this model of the Hunley. This isn't the original one. Um, the Hunley was a very early submarine that was used in the Civil War and eventually um, it sank in the harbor and was later recovered and um, elsewhere in Charleston, you can actually visit the original, uh, but this is a uh, reconstruction, uh, life-size reconstruction that you can see and climb over on the sidewalk. Um, across the street is another house museum, the Joseph Manigault House. Um, another Adam style house built in 1803. The dark side of Charleston's history continues, unfortunately, um, today as well. The church that you can see on the right is the Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church, which is where um, in 2015, in June, a tragedy occurred where 21 um, year old white supremacist Dylan Roof um, entered the church. Um, and sat in on part of a Bible study and then shot and killed nine people, all African-Americans. The senior pastor, Clementa Pinckney, who was also a state senator um, at one point, was among those who were killed during the attack. Um, and not long after, there was a memorial service on the campus of the College of Charleston that was attended by President and Mrs. Obama, as well as the Bidens. On a lighter religious note, you can see um, this, um, this car that was full of bumper stickers on the right. Um, I loved the, the Southern bumper sticker that says, um, may the Lord be with you and also with y'all. Um, you'll hear y'all quite commonly in the South. An example of a house with very tight parking And we're gonna finish the program with just some random street scenes, again, just to give you a flavor of the city. Here are some commercial buildings, big mansions with incredible windows and palm trees. Um, as I said, it's a great place for strolling. If the weather is nice, just wander up and down streets at random and see what you find. There are lots of um, interesting details to come across and almost every house has a porch or two or three. At the end of the day, you can certainly get excellent seafood, of course. 
sit in an outdoor cafe under a crystal chandelier, go shopping in some of the elegant uh, stores. Um, the, a lot of the houses that we're looking at look like they could be museums, but they are not. They are actually just private homes. There are some terrific doorways in Charleston. Here's, um, here's a private home and here's a um, glass window looking into an interesting uh, trendy store. With all the historic architecture, you might be surprised uh, to find some interesting 20th century architecture. There's even some art deco buildings like this old um, furniture store in the commercial district and also um, this old movie theater as well. If you're looking for a getaway for just two, three, four days, um, that's not even two hours from Boston, um, it's an ideal place to visit um, to get uh, history, beautiful architecture, great food, um, and a lot of just pleasant strolling around. This is another um, ex excellent example of a house that is not actually a museum. This is just somebody's backyard. So we will finish there. I want to thank you for joining me. Um, I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Traveling Librarian. And as I mentioned before, do feel free to contact me by email Follow me on Instagram and check out our other episodes of The Traveling Librarian on BB Library's YouTube channel. So see you next time.